and welcome to episode 162 of Real Life Ghost Stories. To kick things off this week, I need to thank some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Sandra P, Anna Graham, Tara Ashley McAvoy, John Tupal, Giovanina Cassius, Joe, Morgan A, Player One, Rose DeVero, Esther Nidunica, Travis, Barry McIntosh, Ella Flood, Lindsay, Miss Grancelli, Martha Sneddon, Naomi Allen, Isle Capola, Angela Scott, and Outlierin. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and I appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week. Our film review is The Mist. The Mist was released in 2008. It has 7.1 out of 10 on IMDb and 72% on Rotten Tomatoes. A freak mysterious storm unleashes a species of bloodthirsty creatures on a small town in New England. And as always, we're going to go through the likes and dislikes for this movie. Let's start with the likes. And I love a situational horror. And this is all centered around a group of people that are trapped in a grocery store. And the movie gets straight into it. We know there's been a storm. We know that everybody's been affected. We know it's been a freak storm. So everyone's in the grocery store trying to top up on their goods, on their items, on food because their electricity is down. And then the mist rolls in and then everything goes haywire. There's no messing around with this film. We get straight into it. And what struck me about this film is that it felt like less of a monster movie and more of a social commentary. So the beginning of the film, it's all about the mist. It's all about the creatures that are in the mist. It's all about scary shit that's happening. People are getting eaten left, right and center. Great stuff for a monster movie. You know, all the good ingredients. And then as things continue, it kind of becomes this social commentary about how different people within like different factions of society might respond in a situation like this. And I was kind of surprised at the depth of that. I understand that it's difficult to get true depth in a film that's about monsters that has a limited period of time. But the example that I think is most pertinent is that there is a woman in the grocery store who is seen as like the local crackpot and she believes that the mist is a plague from God and I'm not going to ruin the film for anybody but I just felt like her character's trajectory throughout the film and how people respond to her throughout the film was really interesting. I really enjoyed watching her and I think she's sort of portrayed as like a villain or at a surface level you see her as a villain But you also see that she completely believes what she is saying and that the things that she says offer something really seductive and alluring to the people around her. I just thought it was really interesting. There's also a whole bit in the film about who do you blame when something is so out of control. Like they're in this situation where life was normal, then suddenly this mist rolled in and all of these crazy monsters are there. Who do you blame? And if you find somebody to blame, what do you then do with that person? And I thought that that was this layer that I wasn't really expecting. So in the beginning, I sort of thought we were going to have stereotypical characters within this monster story. But I kind of actually got quite invested in the characters. I was quite interested in them, in their lives and how it was going to unfold within this grocery store while they were all under attack. I think as well, to its credit... The film used clever bits of movie magic to demonstrate the monsters when you can't actually see them. There were bits that created tension that were done very cleverly. So there was a great bit of cinematography with a rope being pulled really taut and then being like dragged up into the air to demonstrate that the thing that was dragging it was huge. And I thought it was a really good piece of movie magic because it created tension without having to have the actual monster on screen. Because you guys know how I feel about having the monster on screen too much. I just don't ever think it's a particularly good idea. So we're going to move swiftly on to the dislikes. Not going to lie, there were good movie magic moments, like I said, that created good tension. But there were also moments that were incredibly obvious (laughs) and incredibly cliched that were meant to be really tense and you didn't know what was going to happen, but didn't quite hit the mark because you, as a watcher, knew exactly what was going to happen. 
And like I said, in the likes portion, the social commentary was really interesting. But because it was so condensed into one building, into this really short period of time, it inevitably became hammy at points. And I think because they had to make the arc of the characters quite obvious, it meant that they had to over-exaggerate a lot of the script and the circumstances, which made the acting a little bit questionable. Not to do with the actors, I think, but to do with the script and the things they were forced to portray in this really condensed period of time. Uh, Just as an aside, if you're a Walking Dead fan, just tick the Walking Dead characters that you see in this in this film. I was like, oh, you're in the Walking Dead, you're in the Walking Dead, you're in the Walking Dead, which I quite enjoyed. And the last thing that I'm going to write in this dislike column is something that winds me up. I really hate it about these types of films. And I think it's like a universal problem with these films. And it's that you have all of these people. So all of these people are in this grocery store. The mist has rolled in. People are getting eaten left, right and centre. There's tentacles wiggling around the place. There's big flying creatures pinging off the windows. They've all seen, seen with their own two eyeballs, these crazy creatures. And they still question and wonder what the spooky noise is. Let me tell you, you hear a rustling, you turn and run. Because that rustling is going to eat you. You hear a strange whistling noise. You do not stop to try and check that whistling noise out. You leg it and hope. Hope against all hopes that the universe is on your side and you're going to survive. You hope that monster is going to trip while it is running after you. You do not stop in this environment where suddenly you have all of these threats that you've never experienced before. Because I think it would be pretty obvious from the sheer amount of monsters that are eating the people around you that any strange noise or any strange movement in the environment is probably a big old threat. Equally, stop screaming. Stop screaming endlessly. The more you scream, the more those monsters are going to hear you and the more you and all your friends and family are going to get eaten. There you go. If you are ever trapped in a grocery store and all of these creatures from another universe are coming to eat you and your friends and family, just think of those two things. Stay quiet and if something makes noise, it is probably going to hurt you. Sorry, I got a bit ranty there. That is one thing about monster movies that really, really irritates me every time I watch them. So I just had to get it out. I feel better. I feel cleansed. Now, I would be remiss to talk about this film without talking about the ending. I'm not going to give a single thing away about the ending. But after I watched this film, I actually went away and looked up the Stephen King novel versus the ending that they showed in the film. I've never read the Steve. I've never read the book, The Mist. I don't know anything about it or I didn't know anything about it. Now I do. And I do know that the ending of the novel is completely different than the ending of the book. So if you've read the novel and you haven't watched this film, I would suggest watching the film. In order to talk about the ending of this film, I'm not going to say anything too wild or exciting. But after I watched this film, I messaged Dave Keen because I was so shocked by the ending. And I messaged him to ask him if he'd seen the film. And this was what he responded. No, I haven't. But I know pretty much everything that happens in it because of internet memes and such. Yeah. Have you just watched it and sat through the rather shocking finale? Is she not okay after it? Like, I watched it and I, you know, I liked it. I love any kind of a creature feature anyway. And I love a survival story. Great, 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 great. Like, I I was like, yeah, this is a fine film. Like, absolutely grand. And then I got to the end. Holy fuck. I actually cried. I never cry at horror films. I actually cried at the ending. So there you go. I cried at the ending, cried my eyes out. It was a shock. I did not expect it. Stephen King apparently was a big supporter of the ending of this film, being different to how he portrayed it in the book. I think because the ending was so shocking, it's kind of unfair to bump the film up massively. It's definitely a three star film, I think. Like the CGI of the monsters is questionable. They're pretty laughable at times, you know, But that's fine. That's sometimes to be expected with monster movies. 
The social commentary, I think, is interesting, if a little bit cheesy at times. But that ending... That ending... I wasn't okay for a long time after that ending. It's a three stars from me. The all-new Nissan Aria is a fully loaded EV. It's brimming with style and power. Up to 389 horses of it. Innovation and intelligence. E-Force all-wheel drive. It'll pin you to your seat. Your very plush seat. The all-new, all-electric Nissan Aria. Nissan Aria with E-Force expected availability early 2023. E-Force cannot prevent collisions or provide enhanced traction in all conditions. E-Force and 389 horsepower available on Platinum Plus. Nissan calculation using one-foot rollout testing with long-range battery and E-Force only in four-mode with E-Step off. These results are for comparison only and should not be attempted on public roads. Drive responsibly. See NissanUSA.com for details. Progressive presents Adjusting to the Suburbs. You used to associate crickets with silence. But since you bought a house in the suburbs, you know crickets hate silence. If any other creature realized rubbing its legs together made a piercing high-pitched noise, they might think, maybe I won't do that. Constantly. All night long. Luckily, you can save with Progressive by bundling your home and auto. Now that's something to make noise about. Just not constantly. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers. Which brings us to our story this week. So... Before we start the story, all of the eyewitness accounts in this episode are taken from the book The Ghost That Haunted Itself, The Story of the Mackenzie Poltergeist, The Infamous Ghoul of Greyfriars Graveyard by Jan Andrew Henderson. And I bought that on Kindle and I think it was like £3 or something, but you can get a hardback copy too. I also need to give a very big shout out to a fantastic article on the website Spooky Isles, written by MJ Steele Collins and published on the 26th of December 2017, which is all about this story and the background and the history. And it was really where I adapted most of the story from. And then finally, the last bit of the story was taken from a an article called The Most Loyal Dog in History by Erin Kelly. And it was published on April the 8th, 2022 on allthingsinteresting.com. Calm. So let's get cracking straight into the part two of our haunted graveyard exploration. Last week we explored the story of the Chase family vault, a family mausoleum in a graveyard in Barbados that was the scene of extreme poltergeist activity in the early 1800s. While researching for this story, I found another story about a haunted graveyard a little bit closer to home. The story of the Mackenzie poltergeist of Greyfriars Kirkyard is a story that has been suggested to me countless times by listeners, and it was a story that I was vaguely aware of. Haunted graveyard probably meant stones being thrown or, at most, a misty apparition. But I was totally wrong. When I looked into this story, I realised that it has a history that is a shocking enough story on its own, and the haunting is extreme, and the witnesses varied. I always think that there is nothing more fascinating about a country or a culture than how they handle death. According to the writer Robert Louis Stevenson, the Scotch stand highest among nations in the matter of grimly illustrating death. The classic examples of this art are at the Greyfriars. Greyfriars Kirkyard is a cemetery that dates back to the 1560s, but it wasn't always a graveyard. It was originally a beautiful garden that was kept by monks, and in a story that is reflective of the story of the Paris catacombs, the beautiful garden was gifted to the city of Edinburgh by Mary Queen of Scots. But not for use as a garden. There were simply too many bodies for the graveyard of St Giles to cope with, and the garden was the perfect space to make a new graveyard. The Kirkyard stands atop a hill that offers scenic views of the city, but the hill is not a natural hill. The hill was created by the half a million bodies that have forced the land to bulge upwards. The sheer amount of bones means that they don't always stay below ground. They regularly burst through the soil and jut out in the open, especially when it rains. And it rains a lot in Scotland. What the graveyard demonstrates beautifully is how seriously the Scottish people took death. People of all walks of life were buried in the cemetery, and the rich had huge, elaborate and ornate tombstones and big, blocky mausoleums. 
the poor were in pauper's graves, and the victims of the plague were slung into a pit, regardless of status. Not only this, but the graveyard was heavily hit in the era of the body snatchers and grave robbers. But our story really only begins when Charles I tried to make the Scottish Kirk fall in line with the English church, which was not well received by those of the Kirk, many of whom believed that there was no place for a king at the head of the church, and that the head of the church was God alone. Those loyal to the Kirk came together in Greyfriars Kirkyard in order to pledge their allegiance to keep control of the church, and they became known as the Covenanters, and a bloody 50-year war began. And one of the most notable events that happened in the Greyfriars Kirkyard happened at the behest of George Mackenzie. George Mackenzie was a complex man, and at first glance of his history, he even seems to be a force for good in society. He was born in the 1630s and studied law in both Scotland and France and became a lawyer. He defended the Marquis of Argyll, who was a covenanter, and was involved in the witch trials in the 1660s. Interestingly, George Mackenzie dismissed the witch trials, publicly stating that the people being accused of witchcraft were just harmless old women. These actions seem to show a man who is compassionate to the importance of identity and belief, but on balance recognised how easy it was for people to be persecuted in society because they were different. But something happened when Mackenzie became Lord Advocate of Scotland in 1677. The compassion and the fairness he seemed to have demonstrated in his career previously was replaced by a brutal ruthlessness that resulted in the creation of what is believed to be the world's first concentration camp. Despite defending Covenanters previously, Mackenzie was now tasked with dealing with the Covenanters. At the Battle of Bothwell Bridge in 1679, the Covenanters were defeated and Mackenzie ordered hundreds upon hundreds of them to be rounded up and imprisoned in the Greyfriars Kirkyard. The Covenanters were treated horrifically in the Kirkyard. They were starved and disease was rampant. They were left exposed to suffer in the extreme winter elements, and the only means to escape the prison was to renounce their faith and agree to follow the Church of England. It is estimated that Mackenzie was responsible for the death of 18,000 people. When he died in 1691, he was interred in Greyfriars Kirkyard, literally yards from where he had been the cause of the unnecessary suffering of many people years before. For years after, legends and lore of Mackenzie's tomb swirled around in the fog of the graveyard. Children would dare each other to creep up to the door of Mackenzie's tomb and utter a chant intended to rouse the spirit of Bloody Mackenzie. Bloody Mackenzie, come out if you dare. Draw the snake. The children told tales of Bloody Mackenzie's spirit, throwing his coffin around the mausoleum in temper, and there were stories of harrowing screams being heard in the graveyard at night time, Bloody Mackenzie raging and railing against the fact that he was buried in the same ground as his victims. But the real haunting stories didn't start until 1998, when Bloody Mackenzie's tomb was opened. It was December, and it was cold and wet, A storm lashed the city of Edinburgh and the streets sparkled with the intensity of the rain. The cold was also intense and the unhoused community desperately sought places of shelter. One man had a thought. What if he sought shelter in the graveyard? No one would disturb him and it would likely be empty for the night. The mausoleums in the kirkyard would at least give some shelter from the freezing rain. Shielding his face from the rain, he made his way through the headstones and foliage. Forcing the door of Mackenzie's tomb was easy, after years of children daring each other to bang on it and run away. He stepped into the vault, and the stone roof offered immediate shelter from the howling wind and rain. He breathed for a moment in the silence, 
relieved to be out of the elements. The vault was pitch dark, and the man fumbled in his pockets for a lighter. He moved the small flame around the room, and at his feet he was met with a black iron gate. He studied it for a while, trying to decide whether it was a good idea to open it and where it would lead to. Maybe it led into a building, maybe there was some sort of treasure below. His hands moved almost before his brain had registered what was happening, and he lifted the grate off, revealing a stone staircase. Down he descended into the darkness, and he emerged in a second chamber which held four wooden coffins. The man examined the coffins, knowing that it was likely that one of these coffins was Mackenzie's, the man he had heard about as a child, the man they had sung songs about. He heard a crack, soft at first, and he almost thought that he imagined it. Then louder, he looked at the wooden caskets. The noise couldn't be coming from there, could it? He took a step backwards and down he plummeted. A hole had opened in the floor and he had fallen right into a pit. A pit that no one had known about. A pit full of bodies. All around him were skulls, teeth, hair, the remains of rags that these bodies had once been buried in. He couldn't even begin to estimate how many bodies were down there in the jumble of bones. The man flailed and panicked and made his way out of the pit, clambering and crying out. A security guard nearby heard wails and moans coming from the graveyard and went to check it out. As he battled through the weather and made his way through the headstones, he could see a figure in the distance hurtling towards him. He struggled to make it out properly in the wind and rain, but as it approached, he gasped and staggered backwards. A man was hurtling towards him, screaming, covered in filth and mud and dirt that looked for all the world in the darkness to be the remnants of blood. It would seem that something was awakened when the man seeking shelter plummeted through the floor. The very next day, the tomb was the scene of another bizarre encounter. A woman and her friend were visiting the graveyard, exploring its nooks and crannies and reading the ancient gravestones. They had heard the legend and lore of Mackenzie's tomb, but were unaware of the events that had occurred the night before. The door to the tomb had been shut again, and there was no trace of the horrors of the incident that had taken place not 24 hours previously. The women approached the tomb, discussing their childhood experiences with it. Do you remember the rhyme we used to sing when we were children, and how scared we were of bloody Mackenzie? They laughed as they reminisced. Go on, I dare you. I dare you to do it, just like we did when we were kids. One of the women tiptoed up to the door of the tomb, adding as much dramatic effect as possible for the entertainment of her pal. She got to the iron grate of the door and leaned her face as close to it as possible. Bloody Mackenzie, come out if you dare. Draw the snake and lift the bar. In a flash, she was blasted backwards, as though there had been an explosion. She lay sprawled, feet from where she had stood previously at the door. Her friend stared at her, completely dumbfounded by what she had just witnessed. What had just happened? One minute they were giggling about childhood fancies, and then she was hurtled backwards, her body folding as though it was under immense pressure. Eventually she gathered herself, enough to run to the aid of her friend. Oh my god, are you okay? What the hell happened? Her friend was clearly equally as dazed. I don't know what happened. It was icy cold, an icy cold blast of air. It came from inside the tomb. This was only the beginning. The start of over 450 reported violent attacks in the Kirkyard. It was very soon after this that a woman was discovered, sprawled on the ground near the tomb. When she was eventually roused and attended to, it was noted that there was hand-shaped heavy bruising all around her neck. She swore that as she was walking by Mackenzie's tomb, she suddenly felt a pair of hands wrap around her neck. Thinking she was being attacked by a person, she flailed and kicked, 
but quickly realised there was nobody there. She couldn't see anybody, but she could feel the hands, cold hands wrapped around her neck. She kicked and struggled and then nothing. The next thing she knew she was coming to, with a number of people standing around her trying to rouse her. And it didn't stop there. Soon after that, a young man was found in a similar position with a similar ring of heavy bruising around his neck. Edinburgh City Council sat up and took notice and they locked the door of the tomb, declaring the location to be out of bounds to the public. But that was never going to stop thrill seekers, paranormal hunters and vandals from seeing the Mackenzie tomb as the perfect target. In fact, in 2004, two teens broke into the tomb and were found volleying a human skull around. So local author Jan Andrew Henderson decided the way to deter people from entering the tomb in a covert and disrespectful way was for the council to consider offering guided public tours. If people were desperate to see and explore the tomb, they could do it in a controlled and respectful environment. There is a double-edged sword here though. While the tours are respectful and controlled, it would seem that giving whatever resides in the tomb this much attention has led to an explosion in activity. There have been numerous reports of people suffering from physical injuries both in and around the tomb. There have been reports of strangulations, of scratches, of people being overcome with nausea and vomiting, bruising particularly around the neck. Sometimes the injuries occur instantly or they appear later after people have returned home from the tour. A police officer who took the tour stated that After the tour, I decided to go back to our hotel room. I was glancing at The Ghost That Haunted Itself, a book about the story of the Mackenzie Poltergeist by Jan Andrew Henderson, when I felt a sharp burning sensation on the right-hand side of my neck. There were at least five deep scratches that appeared just under my Adam's apple. On returning home the next morning, I went straight to my mother's house and told her my tale along with handing her the ghost that haunted itself, which I decided I did not want in my home. Yesterday, I phoned her and asked her what she thought of the book. Remarkably, she was just examining five large scratches under her Adam's apple that were identical to my own. I am not the sort of individual who frightens easily, but hand on heart, I am very frightened now. The phenomenon that you have in that graveyard prison is very real. And it doesn't stop there. Another witness, Rachel Darrow, also stated, I went on a night tour to Greyfriars Graveyard with friends. In the Covenanters prison, I felt extremely faint and started breathing rapidly. I do not get scared easily, so I don't know why I had this reaction. While we were walking towards the tomb, which we were all going to enter, I felt as if it was suddenly a chilly night. But as soon as we entered the room, I began to shake uncontrollably. I ended up having to brace myself against the wall, shaking and hyperventilating. I felt that I could not breathe properly. I felt better the moment we were allowed to leave the area. This was a very strange thing to happen to me because I've never fainted in my life and I've never felt that way before or since. The next day, I had a welt above my left eye, which did not go away for about two weeks. And if those two eyewitness accounts from people who definitely don't scare easy aren't compelling enough, maybe another one from a self-proclaimed skeptic might help. Jan also toured the mausoleum and said, How would you react if someone told you they'd had a paranormal experience? Would you be skeptical? Gasp in horror? Laugh uproariously? Think it was a load of old cod's wallop? If someone had asked me the same question 12 months ago, I'd have made interested noises at the time and had a good giggle afterwards. But something happened to me in May 2000, which changed all that. The tour began outside St. Giles Cathedral on the Royal Mile at 10pm. And there I was, tagging along with a crowd of 30 holidaymakers and tourists of all ages and nationalities, preparing to be led around the back streets of Edinburgh on a historical tour which culminated with a visit to Greyfriars Kirkyard. As we drew nearer the flight of steps leading up to the ancient Kirkyard, the tour guide, Ben, asked for our attention and advised us 
that we were entering the graveyard at our own risk, that he could in no way be held responsible for any eventualities, and that we were at liberty to back out at any point if we wished to do so. The whisper started up immediately. Do you think anything will happen? Oh God, that's so scary. Are we going to go through with this? I've got to say I found it all highly amusing. As we mounted the dark steps leading into the graveyard, the thirty-strong crowd became strangely silent and moved closer together, away from the shadows. At the other side of the graveyard lay the Covenanter's prison, kept locked day and night with a heavy chain and padlock. I had heard stories about the existence of a poltergeist and read newspaper articles about individuals who had been attacked or experienced some other inexplicable sensation. I was also giggling like mad because a large number of people were getting extremely nervous. Couldn't they see the entire thing was a huge charade, a complete fabrication dreamed up to con unsuspecting tourists? The guide swung the heavy iron gates aside to let us through. Was it my imagination? Or did the air become distinctly chilly as we walked into the prison? Good grief, I was getting as bad as the rest of them. The deeper we were led into the prison, the quieter everyone became. We stopped outside the black mausoleum, the crowd huddling together. I was standing at the edge of the group, a little apart from the others. The guide began to speak. At that moment, I felt the oddest sensation on the back of my head. A light, cold sensation as though someone was tracing a pattern on my scalp with one finger. Instinctively, I turned around. There was no one standing beside me, no one within arm's reach. I touched my scalp. Weird. No trees around either, so it couldn't have been a branch. I was unsettled, but not overly concerned. Then we were led into the tomb itself. It was pitch black with a faint, musty smell. As we huddled together at the back of the tomb, listening to what the guide was saying, all of a sudden I felt violently sick. I could feel the nausea rising in my throat and it took a tremendous effort to remain standing upright. I was convinced I was either going to faint or throw up all over the backpacker standing in front of me. This intense wave of nausea continued for a minute or two. I was fighting it the entire time. But once we were led out of the tomb again into the cool night air, I felt instantly better. But something wasn't quite right. Putting my hands up to touch my face, I realised with a shock that I had lost all feeling there. It was as though I had received a particularly effective anaesthetic at the dentist, numbing it completely. The rest of my body was at a normal temperature, but my face was stone cold. This feeling lasted incredibly for almost half an hour. I've been back to Greyfriars on a number of occasions since, even taking part in a couple of television interviews about the poltergeist there. One film crew wanted to interview me standing in the tomb, and it proved very unsettling, as I was affected in exactly the same way. My face grew cold and lost all sensation. I'm afraid I didn't stay there much longer. On another occasion... The morning after I had taken part in an interview in the churchyard, I woke to find three red marks on my skin, two on my abdomen and one on my leg. They resembled burns but were not painful. All had disappeared within 24 hours. People have continued to report physical disturbances throughout the years. Cold spots, numbness, nausea, panic attacks, scratches, gouges and burns galore. People have regularly reported hearing knocking inside the mausoleum or sounds of items being thrown around. There are also the smells of sulphur and smelling salts. Blackheart Entertainment, who own the ghost tours that are conducted in the Kirkyard, keep a record of all reported encounters over the years. In 2003, a fire swept through Jan Andrew Henderson's home. He is the operator of the tours and the writer of The Ghost Who Haunted Itself, and the fire ripped through his home and the Blackheart Entertainment offices. It destroyed five years' worth of documentation of the Mackenzie poltergeist. None of the surrounding buildings were damaged, and no cause for the fire was ever identified. There were reports of people hearing laughter from within the tomb, and giggling children were seen to play with unseen entities in the entrance of the tomb. 
An unusual amount of birds seemed to gather around the mausoleum and an unusual amount of birds seemed to die around the mausoleum. But the poltergeist activity has not been solely limited to the kirkyard. The houses surrounding the kirkyard have reported bizarre poltergeist activity. Gail lived in a flat by Greyfriars Kirkyard for six months and during that time period she experienced all manner of poltergeist activity. Doors would open and close on their own, the times on clocks changed regularly and inexplicably, but two events witnessed by her boyfriend at the time completely solidified her suspicion that she was dealing with something otherworldly. Gail had a collection of soft toys that she kept in a pile in the corner of her bedroom. She left the house for an hour and when she returned, the soft toys were piled high in a pyramid on the bed. On another occasion, Gail and her partner went on a night out and when they returned, every single picture that had been hanging on the wall had been removed and were piled up neatly one on top of each other in the middle of the carpet in the living room. And aside from all of this, there are those who claim to have seen misty spectres in the graveyard, shadows in the corner of their eyes and white glowing creatures moving in between the gravestones. There are numerous theories about the Mackenzie poltergeist that we will explore later. But one thing is for sure. There are numerous reports of people collapsing, being attacked, being grabbed and being scratched. And as Jan Andrew Henderson puts it, let me put it this way. If the Mackenzie poltergeist isn't a genuine supernatural entity, then I don't think there's any such thing. Not anywhere in the world. To end today's episode, we need to put all of the horrible history and the paranormal activity aside because it would be wrong of me to talk about the Greyfriars Kirkyard without at least mentioning Greyfriars Bobby. The heartwarming story of Greyfriars Bobby goes like this. An older Edinburgh man named John Grey became a police night watchman in the mid-1850s and chose a watchdog to accompany him on his long, duty-filled nights at work. This watchdog was a pint-sized Sky Terrier that John named Bobby. The wee terrier took the job and the devotion to his owner quite seriously. The duo patrolled the cobblestone streets of Edinburgh, stopping at the same place for coffee every shift. However, after several years on the job together, doctors diagnosed Grey with tuberculosis. He grew ill and died in February of 1858. The town buried John Grey in Greyfriars Kirkyard. Bobby was despondent refusing to leave the grave site of his master. Through day and night, through good weather and bad, Bobby is said to have stood guard at John's headstone. The heartbroken little dog only left to eat a meal once a day. When the one o'clock gun fired each midday from the Mills Mount Battery at Edinburgh Castle, the terrier would run to the same coffee shop where his master took him every shift, Trail's Temperance Coffee House. Only now it was the owner, John Trail, who made sure Bobby had his fill to eat. The town sympathised with the little terrier and looked out for his well-being. After initially trying to evict Bobby from the premises, even the Kirkyard watchmen constructed a little shelter for the grieving dog. Even in 1867, nine years after his master's death, when officials enacted a bylaw stating that all stray dogs without licences be destroyed, Bobby was spared. The Lord Provost of Edinburgh, Sir William Chambers, paid Bobby's fee and bought him a collar. It had an inscription that read, Greyfriars Bobby from the Lord Provost, 1867, licensed. It was for a total of 14 years that Greyfriars Bobby watched over John Gray's final resting place. He did so with devotion and loyalty that touched the hearts of anyone who heard about him. Bobby himself died in 1872 and the town gave him a special burial plot not far from his master by the inside gates of Greyfriars Kirkyard. The city council erected a granite statue of Greyfriars Bobby which sits across from the Kirkyard where both of them rest. This was done at the request of Baroness Angela Georgina Burdett Cutts, the president of the Ladies Committee of the RSPCA the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. The unveiling occurred without ceremony in November 1873, one year after Bobby's passing. The plaque reads, 
Greyfriars Bobby, died 14th of January 1872, aged 16 years. Let his loyalty and devotion be a lesson to us all. Tour guides instruct tourists to rub the statue's nose for good luck. Because of this, the finish has worn off the nose, making it look lighter and shinier in comparison to the rest of the body. You can still see Bobby's inscribed collar, bowl and a plaster cast of the famed pooch in the Museum of Edinburgh. Now look here, ladies and gentlemen, there are plenty of people who try to pick holes in the story of Greyfriars Bobby, and I'm not going to do that. We're going to accept it as true, as a beautiful story that went on to inspire one of the best episodes of Futurama, and we are going to embrace the fact that we do not deserve dogs. We do not deserve dogs. They are perfect creatures, they are loyal creatures, and Greyfriars Bobby brought the city of Edinburgh together with love and loyalty. I'm being very dramatic today. I don't know what's wrong with me. But let's get into talking about the Mackenzie poltergeist. People are still doing tours to this day. People are still fainting, dropping like flies to this day. But I do think it's really important to note a few things. The first is that the story of the man looking for shelter in the beginning seems to be more of an urban legend than an actual documented story. So in the book, the ghost that haunted itself, that story is documented as kind of like a narrative, um, like creative writing account, if that makes sense, of what happened. And in it, um, the writer talks about how the police were called and they didn't know what the bodies were. So they just closed it back up and pretended it wasn't happening. There are some people who mix up the story of the boys in 2004 breaking in and taking the skeleton or taking the skull rather there's some people who mix up that story with the story of the the man looking for shelter and the two things get conflated. It's kind of tricky to figure out what the original quote unquote true story is. And I don't know if there is a singular true story to it at all. So the story that was in Spooky Isles, the article that I read, which, you know, was heavily inspired by the book, The Ghost That Haunted Itself. Even that article was different than the book itself. So I don't know what the true story was. Maybe it's a mix of everything. Maybe it's just a local folklore. There's this very, 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 very high possibility that it is exaggerated. For example, in one version, I saw that it was a security guard that found him and the security guard then quit his job the next day and the homeless man was never seen again. In another version, it was just a random member of the public who found, who heard banging coming from the mausoleum and then found this homeless man. I don't know what actually happened. I don't know if anybody knows what actually happened, but it's a good story and it creates a good kind of origin story for the release of the Mackenzie poltergeist. I'm not somebody who knows very much about archaeology or anything along those lines, but I feel like if a plague pit is found, if it is a plague pit, um, if a plague pit is found, surely it would have to be excavated and explored. I'm not entirely sure actually if that is a thing that happens and I'm not sure if those rules are different when it comes to a graveyard, I I don't know. I have no idea. But it's just important to note that there are lots of different versions of that particular story about what happened in 1998. I do think it's also really important to mention the fact that Jan Andrew Henderson wrote this book about the Mackenzie Poltergeist, which is fine. But he is also the person that runs Blackheart Entertainment And there is a very cynical side of me that recognises that actually these stories are very good for business. They are very good for ghost tour business. I know there will be lots of people listening to this who will be thinking the same thing. So I think it is important to highlight that fact. But for this episode, we're going to take it at face value. We're going to take it that these stories, they are true, they are happening and people are having these experiences. And actually reading the accounts of people and reading about people's stories about what has happened to them on various tours. I do think that people are actually having experiences where they're feeling nausea, where they're fainting, where strange things are happening to their bodies. They're getting sensations that they've never felt before. I think these things are happening. I do think that people are walking away with scratches, welts, whatever, whatever. I'm willing to put myself out there and say that I do think those things are happening. But are they the result of the Mackenzie poltergeist or are they rather Mackenzie poltergeist adjacent So what I mean by that is that, for example, somebody goes on the poltergeist tour and they come home and a day later they have a welt over their eye and they say, oh, it's because of the Mackenzie poltergeist. 
or they go home and they have scratches on their leg and they say, oh, it's the Mackenzie Poltergeist. These stories are great for validating the haunting and validating this violent entity. But they're not really taking into consideration the fact that there are actually lots of other possibilities. Uh, I am, for one, somebody who is always bruised, cut. I always have unexplained injuries that I don't know how I got them. I'm not really a drinker, so it's not like I'm drunk all the time and that's how it's happening. I don't know how they happen. I don't know how they happen. I walk into things all the time, maybe, or I must scratch myself in my sleep. I don't know. But is it possible that these people are going on the Mackenzie tour, believing what they hear about the Mackenzie poltergeist, and then having experiences later that they then attribute to the Mackenzie poltergeist, rather than trying to find logical explanations for the things that have happened to them? The other interesting thing about this sort of confirmation bias theory that I have about this is that the symptoms that people are describing, the nausea, the pins and needles, the uh, feeling like you're going to faint, feeling like you're going to vomit, hyperventilating, feeling a numbness, all of those things are very similar to what happens when somebody has an anxiety attack or a buildup of adrenaline in their bodies. So could that account for the amount of people that are fainting, hyperventilating and all those symptoms? I think potentially it could account for at least some of them. And I do recognise that's not going to be a very popular theory among the paranormal community. But I do think it's something that happens a lot more than people realise. I don't think that people take into consideration how powerful anxiety and adrenaline can be in giving you physical symptoms that feel completely alien to you. Interestingly, another theory that is put forward by Henderson is this idea that pheromones are the reason for people's experiences in the Mackenzie tomb. And I was thinking pheromones, like something naturally occurring in the environment. I couldn't really understand what they meant by pheromones. And then what they mean is, what I can gather is it's sort of like an idea of residual energy, but they're trying to make it sound biologically viable. So what they were talking about was the fact that when people are frightened, they release a pheromone. And I actually think that's probably true. I mean, scientifically, maybe. I know that lots of animals do it, lots of insects do it, where they release pheromones where they're under, when they're under threat to either ward off enemies or call the troops in to try and help them, whatever it is. And they've put forward this theory that the amount of people that lived in this original concentration camp that were tortured, starved, terrified for their lives, released huge quantities of fear pheromones that have been sort of trapped in the environment. And I guess, like I said earlier, it's sort of another way of talking about residual energy, I suppose, that like these terrible things happen in an environment and they leave an indelible stain on that environment that sort of perpetuates itself throughout history somehow. So I thought that was quite an interesting way to think about it, but it also made me think about how fear is contagious. So when we are in an environment where we are scared, other people will feel scared too. And it is a really contagious emotion. It's almost like a yawn. Once one person starts to voice fears or feels anxious or nervous, we all pick up on it and we all start to act accordingly. So I wonder if that's a part of it. If you've got a couple of people in your group in particular on these tours who are feeling really anxious and nervous about it, does it kind of infect the rest of the people? in the tour group. And then that leads to another theory. Sorry, I'm just sort of like machine gunning theories at you and I apologise, but I'm going to continue doing it. There is also the theory of the Philip experiment. So we did an episode a couple of years ago on the Philip experiment, which was all about creating a tulpa. Can you think something into existence? And there is a theory that All of the tours of the Mackenzie Poltergeist, all of the stories that have been told and retold and people's perceptions of the Mackenzie Poltergeist and all of that combined imagining, that combined belief in something, has it possibly resulted in the creation of a tulpa? I mean, I personally don't think so. I think it's much more likely that it's misconstrued anxiety that things are happening to people but they're not necessarily paranormal but I thought it was interesting to think about that idea of thinking something into existence somebody recently maybe it was on Instagram or a podcast and they were talking about the power of attraction now it's not something I really know anything about I don't know anything about like the power of attraction and 
positive thinking and this this idea of visualizing things and sort of visualizing it into existence. But the idea is that if you visualize something enough, you begin to act like it's real. I think that's on a, on a, at a very like base level. That's what it is. If you visualize, right, I'm going to get this job, you're willing it into existence, I'm going to get this job, I'm going to get this job, you subconsciously start acting like you are going to get the job, which really subtly changes your behavior, which leads to kind of a more positive outcome. That's the basis of it. Whether or not it's true, I don't know. But it seems like the same thing could work here, that if you're thinking about this poltergeist, poltergeist activity, then you're more likely to interpret things as poltergeist activity. Although that doesn't explain the poltergeist activity in the surrounding areas, in the houses surrounding the Kirkyard. So Gail's story where she talks about all of the toys and photographs being stacked up. What's the crack of poltergeists doing that? Stacking things all up. Is it to do with the decor? Is it because it's eye-catching? What's going on there? Surely there are other things you could do. If you could stack things up, can you write a message on the wall? I don't know. Let me know what your thoughts are. Do you think that the Mackenzie poltergeist is a real thing? Has George Mackenzie never left? Is he horrified by the fact that he was buried in the same place as his victims? It was a place where a really horrific, tragic, tragic period of history played out where people were brutally tortured, murdered, and those who survived were sold off as indentured servants. And just another horrific branch of this story that the indentured servants were packed off into a ship and the ship was wrecked and the vast majority of them died in the shipwreck. So it was a really horrific time for these people who just didn't want to succumb to Church of England rule. And, you know, it's awful. So is it possible that some echoes of all of the atrocities that were committed there are still playing out in the Greyfriars Kirkyard? Is it possible that all that negative energy created this entity that's still being really destructive to this day? Or is it just that we know so much of the story now that anything that happens in the graveyard is going to be put down to the Mackenzie Poltergeist? Let me know what you think. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to learn more about Real Life Ghost Stories Podcast, you can do so by checking out reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. You can also subscribe to Patreon if you are desperate for more content. That is patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content and also every single episode ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. The all-new Nissan Aria is a fully loaded EV. It's brimming with style mm. and power. Up to 389 horses of it. Innovation and intelligence. E-Force all-wheel drive. It'll pin you to your seat. Your very plush seat. The all-new, all-electric Nissan Aria. Nissan Aria with E-Force expected availability early 2023. E-Force cannot prevent collisions or provide enhanced traction in all conditions. E-Force and 389 horsepower available on Platinum Plus. Nissan calculation using one-foot rollout testing with long-range battery and E-Force only in Portland with E-Step-Off. These results are for comparison only and should not be attempted on public roads. Drive responsibly. See NissanUSA.com for details.